um, cat idea fair stuff. So um, that's that's the only difference now. Okay. Um, hold on, I'll just make sure I've got audio uh, correctly across. Um, yeah. uh, can you hear me okay? I'm just making sure I've got that. Yeah. Um, so I have another question. Um, yeah. Like, uh, I, I get the impression that one of the bottlenecks in 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 Cardano are those uh, Haskell experts, right? So, do you have expertise, or do you know someone, or do you work with someone who has expertise in Haskell? Um, I've I've done the Plutus Pioneer program. I've got Haskell. I've got literally about twenty five years of functional programming. Um, yeah, it's like. And uh, so Erlang, OCaml, Haskell, are all functional programming languages. Not only that, um, I've worked in parallel high-performance systems. So I know how to do concurrency, for instance. Uh, it's uh, sort of like uh, riding a bike um, for me, that sort of thing. Um, so, uh, um, and obviously also having been involved in the blockchain space for quite a while um, and a particular fan of the UTXO, um, you know, uh, it's been a bit of a laugh actually seeing all that that um, hoo ha about concurrency popping up um, was was a bit of a joke um, because <laughs> yeah yeah um, so I'm quite familiar with all of all of this sort of space yeah um, I think I actually put in a little bit about the um, UTXO. Um, the, some of the design work as well, the approach that we're taking uh, in terms of its design. So if you're familiar with one of my other proposals in Fund 2, which was the smart market stuff, which is a, a combinatorial auction process, basically optimization uh, of transaction support, that's actually um, part of this work. It's um, hidden underneath it uh, to be able to do the composition of the different curves, which are themselves each, you can think of each curve as being a kind of dex, um, and so you've kind of, uh, in the base configuration of the risk adjusted bonding curve, you've got about five curves, but you can bolt in a few others, depending on what you're trying to do. Um, and each of those curves represents um, one or two order types. Um, and from that, you're basically trying to, um, you're creating a continuous option underneath the hoods. If any of that made sense. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I said it was a great answer. So, yeah. All right. Oh, see, I mean, I can talk about this stuff for ages, or we can go <laughs> and talk about other things. I don't mind. Um, either way around, um, yeah, we can dive into all sorts of things. But if you want to learn more about um, just even, so there's actually, I've got um, four proposals up in Catalyst. Um, Two of them are in the developer ecosystem. One is for a bonding curve SDK. So the core mechanism here is bonding curves. And bonding curves are just a mathematical relationship between a token, uh, two tokens. Um, we're actually doing, uh, there is a, um, some work that I will probably do around what's referred to as surfaces. So that's when you're actually trading automatically quite a number of different tokens. So like half a dozen tokens between one lot to another. Um, and um, uh, so they're referred to as bonding uh, surfaces. But the proposal out there is just to do the curve stuff. And you can have lots of different types of curves. The curve design is actually quite uh, involved. Um, so the idea here is you go to a command line tool uh, to begin with, and you just specify the parameters of what you want for the curve. Um, and you instantiate it, and away you go. That's the that's the idea. There's a uh, quite a few projects um, implementing their AMAs, AMMs right at the moment. It's yeah. uh, have have a uh, have you spoken to any of them, seen seen what they're doing? Uh, I'm quite well aware of what a bunch of them are doing. Yes, uh, I'm familiar with uh, yeah. MiniSwap. Um, Mel, Mel is not really an AMM, but um, uh, Sunday swap, 
those two have been a bit vague in terms of what they've provided in terms of information. Uh, the one that's actually doing a DEX that appears to have the best understanding of what's actually going in is the uh, Maldex. Um, I think that's called, is the demon one, the little red yeah. character. Dude. Yeah, Maladex. Yeah, Maladex. Um, they're about the ones that seem to have the best understanding of what's actually uh, required to do a UTXO-based DEX. Um, the, the idea behind the a bonding, uh, a, an AMM is basically just a curve, right? As I said, between mm. two tokens. The distinction between a bonding curve and your standard sort of AMMs is that largely within a bonding curve, the second token is minted or burnt, okay? So that's a key difference. Um, so there's no um, uh, supply upfront, it's driven by demand. So if people come in and buy it, more and more tokens will get minted. And um, if people start selling them, then the tokens get burnt. So the, the supply of uh, the second token fluctuates. Uh, you can put limits on those and you can change the conditions upon which um, they're done. But the idea here is if you're setting up any sort of project, you can do a form of continuous financing with it. Okay, so that's different than saying issue a whole bunch of tokens and try and get them listed in a DEX or instantiated DEX between my token and ADA, that sort of thing. There's a difference in that way. Okay. Yeah, um, and, and the the reason for working um, these these proposals, uh, the continuous financing one and the uh, retroactive project funding one, um, they can either complement each other, or I had to write them in a way which um, they could be done independent of each other. So the key distinction between the two is that um, if they both got funded, then that's great because then I'll make an SDK for the bonding curves and an SDK for the retroactive uh, project funding. Um, and we'll get the reusability of each. If just one of them gets done, well, then that's no problem. I can just, uh, we wouldn't be necessarily focusing on the reusability and the um, SDK for the one that didn't get funded at the point, but we'd still be using bonding curves. Okay. Um, and the broader intention with the other proposal that's up there, which is, um, I've got up there is um, in the metadata one, which is to do, more with the work I'm most interested in, which is uh, social and environmental finance. Um, so uh, this one is to do give users security and confidence, which is somewhat related to um, the formal specification work, uh, but also to um, sort of it's not too dissimilar to what you're talking about the other week, Peter, in terms of um, you know spam detection and stuff like that. Obviously, the, the aim here is to give people confidence. Um, that's or you know, in your case, it's to get rid of the scam. In this case here, how do you express um, the set of parameters or the conditions under which this project token is being issued or uh, things? And this is using something referred to as a Ricardian contract. And largely what that is, is it's a way of, think of it as an entity that bundles um, the uh, language, human readable language form of a contract with uh, that may be have legal veracity uh, with any of the associated parameters that might go to say configuring a curve uh, along with the actual code itself like the smart contract code to say this is the hash of the smart contract code. Um, and this is a way of actually bundling a whole lot of information together to say that this is a legitimate piece of code in some way, okay? So that's what that is. And the reason for doing that is because I wanna be able to use the risk adjusted bonding curves to fund impact work. And I need to say, what is the project that's been funded? So you can think of the Ricardian contract as wrapping all the parameters from a catalyst proposal, for example, as an NFT. Um, so it can be uniquely identified and that forms the project. On that side. Just trying to visualize how that um, would work. So uh, I'm, I'm just trying to visualize uh, uh, you know, the smart contract code being wrapped in an NFT. So it's someone else is building this project, putting it in place, wrapping it up so we can uh, verify it that way is, uh, I'm, I'm just- Yeah, uh, so, so you're not specifically wrapping up the, the uh, verification code that goes on Plutus. You're basically taking, taking the hashes to say, this is the, the, the code that we're referring to. 
Um, and the way is, is it's basically to um, give give contracts, digital contracts, some form of human understandability. Uh, and the whole way the legal system operates is based on the idea of meeting of minds. So a contract is only valid if there is a meeting of minds. That means that both parties or the parties to a contract can actually understand it. Uh, so a key idea here is that basically um, you uh, have the standard prose of whatever your contract is, and a contract can simply be like, um, and most people don't think of it, but uh, a catalyst proposal itself is actually a contract. It, um, uh, you know, with, in this case here, the community, et cetera. Um, this is what we're proposing. This is what we're going to do. This is what it looks like. Um, and so in this case here, if we were to use the risk-adjusted bonding curves to actually fund uh, projects in, you know, in a catalyst-type form, uh, then we need a way to bundle up the proposals and say, this instance of a, um, of a risk-adjusted bonding curve is associated with this proposal. And it's got all the you know, necessary parameters and things. That gives you the, all the metadata and the machine readable forms, which can then be surfaced up into like a D app web store, that sort of thing, or in the case of the uh, impact finance to be able to surface up what the impact work is intended to be. Um, so if you're trying to fund education in India, then this is the pro uh, project, these are the outcomes, this is what's going to be spent, those sort of things would be put into the recording contract. Totally understood. It's really cool. I've so I'm learning a lot joining these uh, town halls. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> that's a huge good. lot more than I would. Yep. Oh, that's excellent. Uh, that's excellent. And any other questions on that? Or anything really? Um, you know, you don't, we don't have to focus on these things, but uh, I, I will happily talk your ears off about them <laughs> in different ways. <laughs> so it's up to you <laughs> if you've got other questions. I had a question, Robert. You, you, just in those descriptions, you mentioned some of the DEXs uh, like Sunday Swap and the others. And I know when Sunday Swap was, were first proposing, um, they were talking about um, an, a way to buy in with an initial stake offering. Is, is that the way it's still going, not just for Sunday Swap, but for other tokens on Cardano, is that the way they're heading? It seemed to me that it's a little bit like the Kasuma or Polkadot sort of crowd loans, it's the same sort of system. Um, I would say that that's generally how a lot of them are doing it. You know, you, it's basically ICO 2.0, whatever, you know, kind of situation. Um, what um, the the trend here, I think Miniswap has done something called FISO, which um, I can't remember what the F stands for, um, but the idea of going to stake pools, um, meld of, uh, running their stake pools and you know you've got to be delegating to them in order to be able to get the airdrop um, those sort of things so there's various sort of experiments around how to do fancier airdrops of tokens and largely this is playing on the idea of bimo fear of missing out in a lot of cases on speculative greed um, which is fine for for those sort of projects that's fine um, and a lot of people will also just uh, projects will just issue tokens that somehow or have some relationship to the project, but it's never necessarily really clear, um, well, at least not to me anyway, what that relationship is. Um, we've got a different uh, token. Uh, some will start to call them governance tokens, but you know, yeah, you could, that's okay, sure, that's what DeFi started you calling them. But realistically, they're, they're, they're more like growth tokens because again, you know, you can, um, value them. Yeah, they could be using used to vote for the uh, ongoing improvements of the project or the um, the protocols that might be underneath them. Um, but in some cases, it's really just to try and raise a ton of money um, to fund the project. So the uh, America project, um, they are doing a uh, they've got a stake pool, uh, but they are offering full rewards back, and they're just distributing their tokens it's a purely governance token as well so that they're not technically they're raising money by getting people staking to their stake pool but then they're distributing their um america tokens uh from their stake pool uh, to whoever's staking on their pool and uh, ray wallet is working in a similar way as well and certainly with the stake pools it opens up a lot of opportunities uh, in a lot of different ways of actually doing project funding um because you know 
as, as you pointed out, Peter, is just um, just even if you weren't doing a token, just purely delegation to a state pool is um, a, a good way to actually fund the project um, for doing that sort of thing. One, one of the things I might point out within um, the risk adjusted bonding curve and the bonding curve work is because you've actually got a reserve that's been constructed underneath. So let's say the relationship is between uh, the ADA token and your token, um, your project token, um, that ADA is going into a reserve. Uh, to create a, uh, effectively a liquidity pool. So the liquidity pool itself uh, could be delegated. Uh, we can delegate that using smart contracts. Um, so that in turn can actually provide money back into the reserve pool of um, your risk adjusted bonding curves to help fund projects. So there's quite a lot we can actually do with um, the stake pool model um, of delegation. So there's a heck of a lot. And I don't even think we've really just, we've, we've really only just scratching the surface of what we can actually do there. It's um, interesting, uh, Adana are um, delegating their stakes in ADA. Eventually when their DeFi loans um, are coming to market, they're staking their ADA to various stake pools in the community. So instead of creating their own, they've decided to um, stake it to a uh, community-driven stake pools and uh, many mission-driven ones too. So it's a, a nice approach, I think, especially after all the heat that um, Meld and other ISPOs have had. Yeah. Well, again, because um, I haven't, you know, the risk of one of the nice things about the risk of just the bonding curve is that actually a stake pool can be the sponsor of it. So if you're doing impact-related work that had specific outcomes, right, the state pool uh, could actually be the project sponsor, right? So, um, you know, and that sort of uh, leverages uh, um, the treasury of the state pool effectively because you've got this uh, rewards flow coming in. So you might say, right, 50% of the rewards or 100% of the re rewards is going into a treasury that funds all these uh, um, uh, risk adjusted bonding curve based impact projects. And so you go from not just being mission oriented pools, whereby they take the reserves and we just hope that they are in fact spending on projects. Um, we can turn that delegation uh, into actual mission driven funding opportunities, uh, a, a true form of actual impact financing through the state pool, which I think is really cool. Yeah. This is crazy, this is awesome. It's not just really cool. <laughs> It just takes uh, the mission-driven staple to a whole new level. So, yeah, there's quite, okay. quite a lot. Um, nope. yeah. And the sponsors don't have to be a single uh, pool either. Um, uh, you know, the sponsors could be multiple. Um, and indeed, it could be like Catalyst plus a mission-driven pool, you know, that sort of thing. It's all up to how you just configure the um, the inputs. You know, where is, where is the money going into the... the, the um, Who's going to be the buyer of the successful result? Um, and that could be, you know, 50% is coming from Catalyst Treasury, 20% from the state pool, and 20% from the state pool. Yeah, nothing stopping you do, from doing that. You can start to compose. That's what I mean by um, the idea of programmable value streams, is you can start to bolt these things together to configure quite exotic sort of instruments uh, that can do some pretty interesting stuff. Us. So what you're saying is that uh, by adding adding extra value to where you stake, uh, not just relying on what the pool output is. That's correct. Yeah. You, you could you could make oh, let's call it interest. You could make more more money out of your stake. Yep. Um, by spreading it across besides the pool, a couple of other hmm. other other interesting uh, projects. Hmm. That's correct. Okay. Um, so, you know, a big idea with in terms of trying to make it um, a reusable modules, uh, modular system um, and hence to focus on sort of like the formal methods work. Uh, aside from the fact that I consider that to be the right way to engineer things, um, there's a couple of things in this. First of all, you've got this um, fantastic infrastructure you know, that has had all that proper engineering done, the formal specifications or the testing, all that work done. It'd be absolutely stupid a waste of it. To then go and put a jalopy on the rails, you know, on these gold plated rails, so to speak, right? For starters. So that's a personal opinion. Um, but more importantly, is this idea of modularity and composition. So when we start talking about 
detaching inflows from different um, uh, treasuries, uh, going into being used in stake pools, and then being structured in different ways, um, the, the, that, that rigor of modularity and composition becomes really, really important because you want to understand how the composition behaves. Does the composition of say two risk of, uh, two bonding curves behave like a single bonding curve? What about four? Do they behave the same way? What about when you start stitching bonding curves, to, uh, risk adjusted bonding curves together, such that you do a form of milestone based project funding? You know? Because a buyer of um, a result can be another risk adjusted bonding curve. Um, so these are known in uh, project financing circles as real options analysis. They're a type of an option analysis that you can start stitching these things together. Um, but you want to make sure that when you do that, that they're going to behave in an expected way, the way you expect, you know, they're going to do what you expect them to do. And the only way I know how to do that is through uh, rigorous software engineering with um, you know, proper formal specifications. It also so happens that that's the um, uh, idea behind the certification framework uh, that they've announced uh, last week at the summer, the different levels of the certification framework for smart contracts. Right. You're all stunned. <laughs> I'm, I'm just looking up for, I'm just trying to find this, um, uh, uh, the specification for the bonding curve that you were talking about by, um, oh, by uh, yeah. So if you go down to, um, oh, not recurring contract one, which is what I'm on at the moment. Um, if you, I'll, I'll put the link in the chat in the moment. Um, it's, it's referred to in the actual proposal. Um, and, uh, it's uh, there, I'll, send, I'll put the link in to the chat. Um, and I can walk, walk you through it there. This is the actual, uh, so Shruti did it when she was at um, Block Science. It was commissioned by IXO, which is um, an impact related um, chain that's been around for a little while. Uh, the reason why I came upon it is when I was, I was working in this uh, blockchain impact space myself. So I knew about XO. Uh, and I was actually designing something very similar from um, uh, to what this um, risk adjusted bonding curve was. Um, but it was actually, uh, Shruti's done a better job than me. Um, so, you know, hey, don't go and reinvent the wheel. Um, so this has been implemented on Cosmos. Um, and you'll also find that uh, just recently, for example, Vitalik has been talking about retroactive funding within Ethereum that's getting uh, public goods funding because basically Ethereum doesn't have a treasury. So they're sort of saying, how the heck do we fund all the common good work that's being done you know, on the base infrastructure? Because we don't have a treasury. So that's a topic of concern within the Ethereum space. So they're trying to figure out how to do this. Um, and so, uh, yeah, the, the GitHub is basically a, you could think of it as a white paper, but it's, um, it's a very technical white paper with actual code that you can execute and simulate and tweak and work out whether or not your parameter changes to the curves is going to do what you expect. Um, so uh, it's written, um, the simulations have been done in uh, something called CAD-CAD, which stands for Complex Adaptive Computer-Aided Design. Um, so it's a systems dynamic modeling system. Yeah. Uh, so it is a really, really, this is another thing that's very close to my heart, so to speak, is um, what Shruti's done here is referred to as token engineering or token economics. Um, and this is really, really important because sure, I could go off and write code, right, to implement something, but you're actually dealing with market mechanisms here. You're dealing with lots of um, independent agents. The idea that everyone's acting in a free market. The notion of a free market here is everyone's able to make their own choice. That's the distinction, okay? Does not mean that there's no rules. It just means that people can make their choice whether they play the game or not. Um, and so because of that, you've also got strategic actors and other sort of things where they can come along and, you know, attack the system. So you want to make sure that the mechanism design is actually going to do what you expect it to do. And that's what the tools like CAD-CAD is there for. This is a really, really good example of all of that. Um, so you can go and look at the actual simulations. You can run the code. You, uh, they're all presented as Jupyter Notebooks. 
um, and so you can dive in that um, on that side. So there's a heck of a lot of really good stuff in this um, place, but uh, um, to me, it's really cool. <laughs> um, so I was, uh, the work that we were originally doing, I was working with uh, complexity scientists at uh, Tapuna Matatini, which is our um, principal research center of complexity science. So my colleague was uh, the one that shut down the country for COVID, um, uh, you know, because he did all the COVID modeling. So, uh, 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 but that's the idea, you know, if you're looking at say the epidemic rates of COVID spread and things like that, you're doing some sort of simulation and modeling to figure out where it's going. This is exactly the same sort of thing that's been done here. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. And anything of any sort of uh, complexity needs to have this sort of thing. It's sometimes referred to as the digital twin because this is what it's referred to in power systems and engineering and stuff. You build up this digital model of what you're actually about to build and, and does it work the way it works? Does the, the plane wing engine stay on? You know, that sort of stuff. Um, and this is the same sort of thinking but applied to economic systems. Uh, yeah. Looks like I have some new bedtime reading. Oh, I can give you lots. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just uh, Googling the basics of bonding curves and understanding the mechanics behind them first. Uh, if you look at the then proposal. Then I might move to this GitHub repo. Yeah. Um, yep. Well, I, in the previous proposal uh, in fund, was it six, five? What was the fund five? Um, because I knew most people wouldn't really sort of understand what this project was, what bonding curves were and what um, risk adjusted bonding curves was, the fund five proposal was really just a mere attempt to outline all the, some of the possible uses for bonding curves and risk adjusted bonding curves. So if you actually look at that proposal, there's a whole lot of links in there that you might find uh, worth reading. Um, some of them are replicated here, but uh, I'll put the link into the prior proposal. Um, uh, yeah. What, what do you think, how much would it be possible to use the bonding curve as well as a bridge finance model? For example, we see right now, establishing several funding models in Cardano. We have Project Catalyst, Imorgo release our own funding system as well, DC, DCF release our own funding system as well. Hmm. Where we can see, okay, Catalyst is really nice as an incubator. You establish your team, you get the first kick off, you can say, okay, you prove your project. Now for projects who build up in Catalyst, as they grow, they have a natural need for more resources. So in each mm -hmm. funding round, the logic result is that they add more and more proposals. They need more and more resources from Project Catalyst. So it's not really intelligent to keep this project for a long-term approach in Project Catalyst because they will just take too much space and they can't really grow because the funds are quite too small. So by saying, okay, let's, let's say for example, just thinking out a little bit. Catalyst as the very first incubator stage, a project is established, is built there. Then after a certain level, let's say, okay, they've established a team, they are able, they show the community, they are able to deliver. Moving forward to the next step, Imorgo funding, for example, where you have a 100 million um, uh, fundraise. Okay, can apply there. Next step. After this, let's say, for example, this is like an angel, what, so, so like angel whatnot, and then moving forward to the next step, DCF funding. So your theory A, for example. Mm -hmm. But now between the steps, there are gaps, no? And how is the transition now from a project which establishes a catalyst, which moves forward in a Imogo fund, which moves there forward to the DCF fund? establish more and more, building really an enterprise or a DAO or whatnot out of a very first beginning start in Project Catalyst. How could a bonding curve match the gaps between the steps by moving forward? Um, typically there isn't um, between uh, incubation, which is what Catalyst <laughs> is, uh, and then sort of seed funding into uh, accelerator or um, an angel sort of investment and then your A, B, and C series venture capital, they're all sort of defined for different stages within the development of a uh, product or a company. Um, 
in this particular case here, that becomes kind of one way to look at it is you can actually do something such that, okay, let's model that step as a series of vesicle adjusted bonding curves. And it's each, each step when you transition, um, you, know, you get up to that point, um, the buyer of uh, that transition point is another bonding curve. And what you can actually do is you can, as a form of investment, is that that second bonding curve is actually um, the reserve is pre-filled. There's sort of conditions like um, you know, typical sort of vest, vesting stages. Um, so it's, it's this idea of stitching it all together so that the one becomes the buyer of the next one, the, uh, the, uh, the one risk adjusted bonding curve gets brought out by another risk adjusting bonding curve and so on. It's a, because bonding curve mostly, if I got it right, it's very light on milestones. So okay, besides, so it's, let's say for example, okay, you have your project, you have to set a certain goal, let's, let's say. Investors come and say, oh, okay, it's a promising project. I think they, I believe they will arrive to achieve their goal. I can invest in this project. So I can obey the native, native tokens of this project. So when you match them all together and you say, okay, first milestone is, for example, catalyst establishing a project. Second one is Imorgo. Third one is DCF. Fourth one is being totally independent from any fundings. And you as investor, you could say, okay, you don't, you really invest in a long, long, long term approach because you have all of the stations, all the milestones to do. Um, so this is largely how equity behaves anyway, um, and startup financing typically behaves because um, often there's some notion of a convertible note to begin with. Now that's a um, starts off life as a debt instrument, but largely used because they can't don't know how to value something, um, and so they want to wait for the second uh, round of valuation, the second round of investment before they actually do the uh, valuation. So a convertible note of different types is used to, get, starts off as a debt instrument, which then gets converted into uh, equity when certain thresholds or uh, milestones are met. Um, and then once you're into equity, you've kind of got a, what's referred to as a discretionary instrument, um, which basically means that uh, unlike debt, which has very specific rules, it can adjust and change, okay? So a, a equity-like instrument can then be absorbed by another equity-like instrument. So you often have uh, share splits, those sort of things. In each round, there's a revaluation and reissue of new shares or uh, different types of classes of shares with different voting rights, those sort of things. Um, so you can replicate that sort of stuff with a risk-adjusted bonding curve or um, and uh, to achieve those, where the milestones literally are the sort of uh, funding rounds. But you can go a lot further than that as well. The, the um, risk adjusted bonding curve is a is a, a unique instrument referred to as Dequity, um, which most of you probably have never heard of. Um, uh, but it's, it's a combination of a debt instrument and equity. And unlike a convertible note, where it has a very discrete event that triggers the conversion, um, the uh, risk adjusted bonding curve can move between being very debt like, which is um, you know, very rule-based, very uh, triggered by outcomes, those results and those sort of things, to being very discretionary, which is what the uh, equity-like product is, uh, to allow for adaptation or changes. When you don't quite meet your milestones in the time, let's make a decision to roll this over or we'll revalue those sort of things. Um, uh, so there's quite a number of ways you can adjust or parameterize the, the actual underlying instrument. So the, the broader answer is yes, you can um, do exactly what you're talking about, such that going through those different stages. It make a fucking bunch of sense. Because at least what it is in Cardano about, you want to allow people to build their projects on top of Cardano and you want to allow them to be sustainable as well. Catalyst is huge in establishing collaborations, acting as incubator, and fails gloriously by allowing the projects to be sustainable. So really thinking about more and more how the community can come up also to establish those pipelines to say, but also to be careful with this, to also say, okay, how can we keep it a little bit grassroots? 
So let's say, for example, there's a proof of soul for a project. We don't want to establish just copies of what we have out there in our systems. So let's say, for example, that there is this provided pipeline, but as a project, you, have, you need the proof of soul. You have to make sure that you stick to community guidelines, for example, that you're not becoming just another shark capital whatnot enterprise building vertical here hierarchies and everything. So that a certain enter to this pipeline is also linked to certain commitments established through the pipeline as well. Right. So um, quite a lot of existing instruments do that already in terms of um, like, for example, typically uh, companies are established for something like a constitution that, you know, we've been talking about with respect to the Eastern Town Hall. Um, that there is a sort of shareholder agreement often goes in when you're um, buying shares or investing and stuff, there will be a uh, shareholder agreement set up, typically referencing or driven by a term sheet. Um, the, uh, that will define the sort of parameters. When you're getting into further, you know, details like with DAOs or community groups, with, which this device can be used for as well, um, you know, they become... Uh, ways of evaluating, they become a measurement, reporting, and verification framework upon which you, uh, you know, make decisions and determine whether something's successful or not. Uh, so, uh, while the risk adjusted bonding curve itself is, you know, quite a neat little uh, uh, adaptive chameleon in terms of the way it performs, like equity and something like, like that, um, it does rely on this notion of what an outcome is. And an outcome is, you know, going to be defined. I mean, ultimately, it's up to humans to define what is valuable. Machines don't care. You know, it's humans that define value. And when we actually come in and, you know, do things like the proof of soul that you're talking about, then um, that's a way of doing those sort of things, you know, um, to the bonding curve, like with the Ricardian contracts, could include... Uh, what the purpose of this particular project is for and what its outcome should be. Yeah. And this is this touches on, um, I'm not doing this in this work at the moment for the uh, bonding curve work, but it's very much in my mind. Um, uh, Catalyst, I, I should say, Cardano is actually a multi-capital accounting, a bookkeeping system, okay? We have the ability, whenever we ever use any output, uh, UTXO output, it supports a bundle of assets. Right? So you know, we often think of a token just in isolation, but there's actually nothing to stop you using a bundle of tokens as a single unit. Okay? And in fact, inside of uh, the specifications for the UTXO stuff, they actually state that uh, a UTXO is a vector uh, value. Okay, as opposed to a scalar, right? So it holds a, a vector value. A single output is a vector of uh, different types of currencies. Okay, that's a multi-dimensional accounting system. Right? That means we can do things like four, six, 10, 24, 500 if we wanted to. You know, wouldn't practically because, but but you could. Um, as treating each uh, UTXO as we treat a single unit on a, uh, of money today. But now we can specify very rich dimensional value systems. Right? And Cardano is the only one that does that at the moment. Right? And that's really important to me uh, because that idea of multi-dimensional accounting gets to your idea of soul. It's a thing that's been done here in New Zealand, which is known as the Wellbeing Budget and Wellbeing uh, Living Standards Framework. So all government agencies are required to report across four capitals. Um, and this is really important for environmental change sort of work. Um, and uh, so this is where, instead of a bonding curve, we start talking about bonding services, okay, where we can start to convert between bundles of different types of tokens that represent different forms of capital. Um, so that's you know, to provide far more nuance to what's actually going on in the world. Because most the, the accounting systems and the monetary systems we use today is based on 
uh, Piccoli's a 14 whatever century um, book of ma magic and arithmetic. Right. Hasn't really changed much, double entry accounting. Right. Um, so now we've got a bookkeeping system that we can layer over uh, a lot of uh, more sophisticated double entry multi-dimensional accounting over the top. And there's work going on doing that, not in Cardano, but there is work going on doing that. I, um, one of the things I think I refer to as uh, reporting 3.0 in one of the proposals somewhere. But that's what that I, um, stuff is. And that gets down to um, measuring or being more nuanced around your um, outcomes and your performance measuring. It's a way of codifying, if you like, or quantifying SOL. In, in, in a way which is actually makes it quite accountable, uh, quite transparent, quantifiable. Um, and so that would be turning the curves into a surface. It also can be used as building blocks for DAOs so that you have a oh, yeah. DAO building pipeline. Yep. Which you can directly promote to people just joining the ecosystem in a later stage, for example, when Catalyst funds rise bigger and bigger. And let's say you have several groups or small enterprises joining in, because right yep. now it's not so interesting for those kinds of, let's say, small enterprises, small coding enterprises, five, six people. Ah, they, they can't apply for funds. They can't even ask for funds just to pay those five, six people. And let's say they're really ambitious and really want to change things. And so let's say, for example, in a fund 10, there's an established pipeline who can give them all the building blocks, all the pipeline and say, okay, this is your start. Tick, 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 tick. All the building blocks are there already. You can use it individually to build up your project. And building by this, when you have a pipeline of building DAOs, it's very easy to establish the DAO of DAOs. Yep. Because when all using the same pipeline, the same way, but everybody uh, own a way, but in the same direction, the connection is already there. Yeah, there's actually a really good example of that sort of idea already happening, not in the blockchain space, um, but actually in um, white rear manufacturing uh, called Hire. Um, they use a type of uh, multi-party contract called a VAM. That's, it's very common in um, China because they don't have the standard sort of Silicon Valley uh, um, uh, venture capital model. Uh, so it stands for a value adjusted mechanism. Um, and it is very much like the risk adjusted bonding curve. Um, in fact, it's scary to say. Uh, so Hire uh, is one of the largest white rear manufacturers in the world. They own GE appliances. They use own Fisher and Paykel appliances here and some big French appliance company. But they are literally uh, organized as a bunch of small little micro enterprises of between eight to 10 people that are, have their own P&Ls, which is what you're kind of getting at, their own in, um, uh, uh, metrics for performance. Um, which is driven by PL. So they have internal customers um, and they're organized like that. They're all autonomous. They can go off and do things. And the primary mechanism by doing that is something that this contract type called a VAM, which is pretty much it's a multi party relationship with performance measurements on it, such that it can adjust and act discretionarily as it goes along. And that's how it's organized. It's, a, uh, it's quite a large company. Um, I can't remember how many employees, and 98% of it is owned by the employees. So there you go. Mm. Um, so people who make fridges are ahead of the game. <laughs> what, what was the name of the company again? Oh, yeah. Jack can talk about it a little bit. Um, sure. I mean, yeah. I want to ask something different, actually, if you want to ask real quick. Yeah, because I, I'm wondering if there is a way to to game this system to game uh, risk adjusted funding goes like there is right. Um, well, yeah. Um, so that's a big part component of uh, doing the me um, mechanism design with the economic model is to understand and do the simulation work at that level is to understand where the risks are um, in terms of gaming. What what happens because you're in a free market where you've got strategic rational agents that you cannot control, there will be people trying to figure out how to actually gain 
these things. The individual risk-adjusted bonding curves um, are a little trickier to do, but it certainly becomes a, a real issue as you start composing more and more of them. Um, because you sort of see that with uh, some of the sort of derivative products on Ethereum, for example. Um, there's like, well, MEV, even though it was documented like five years ago or something, most people didn't know about it or didn't think about it. Um, and uh, until it sort of blew up, the flash lines was another one, sort of uh, um, doing really quick um, loans and turning things around to form a strategic play. Uh, so the idea behind the economic modeling is to actually flesh a lot of that out, to try and understand the uh, economic model um, and how it will perform under different types of scenarios, different parameter settings. And that's where the simulator, simulation becomes really important because you just, you run that simulation through lots of different permutations. Um, so the CAD-CAD uses what's referred to as a multi color simulation. Um, so that's basically, uh, you can, uh, it varies the various parameters and stuff to see how the mechanism will perform under different uh, parameter settings. Yeah. But it's not it's not a um, a complete answer. Uh, it's just that the um, by doing that sort of work up front, you've got a much better understanding of what the performance of that particular mechanism should be, um, and so therefore you know less likely to have missed edge edge cases and things. Um, so you'll see now that CAD starting to get picked up, um, and there's a whole lot of work that's going on with Rye Balancer. Uh, Gitcoin have been using it. Um, a, whole, a number of projects have started using it on Ethereum to try and start uh, testing and, and designing their newer protocols and new smart contracts. Thank you. So let's say, okay, you have all this beautiful stuff and Bonding curve mostly says also, okay, each project they have their native tokens. And how do you include this into the vote and into the governance process then when it comes to voting, for example? And where we know that we have right now, well, we have, for example, for Catalyst, a plutocratic voting system, and it's maybe not the best way to go. So how yes. can you... Plutocratic <laughs> is one of the best. <laughs> yes. So, but, but so we've, got a, we've got a plutocratic approval voting system. It's one of the worst. Um, yes. the, uh, the, the, um, in terms of uh, aligning preferences overall. Um, uh, so uh, small tweaks um, that can be done on the back end in terms of how you count the votes. I don't actually know what algorithm they use to do the counting. Um, but could minimise the impact of that. But your point here is that... Um, how can a bonding curve as opposed to a risk risk adjusted bonding curve be used? Well, I'll just step yeah. because ch just by naming the point, because by let's say, for example, bonding curve, what AMM does already, it's it's not ad hoc funding like we have in Catalyst, for example, it's fluid funding continues. Mm. So the same problem what we have very often with, with our systems, I think the same in Catalyst or what we have in our societies is also this ad hoc funding. So you are uh, voting. So you vote. You vote once, and then yes, you have the shit for the next three, four, what not years, something like that. So, but by by saying okay, the bonding curve, for example, when I invest, it's already a sign of endorsement. It's already a sign of trust. So investing and voting comes quite close to each other, at least when you look on it from this side. Right. So the, the key distinction between market mechanisms and social choice mechanisms is the one doesn't have price. Um, so social choice are to do with um, things when we don't have a market price, what's going on. So that's all things like voting and stuff. But um, one of the key things is equity and debt are a type of governance device. Okay. Um, so hence the risk adjusted bonding curve is a governance device. Uh, so that's the idea of equity that it can move between being rule, very rules based, very prescriptive, and being or move towards being very discretionary, which is you know discretionary. We can have our choices, we can have deliberation, those sort of things going on. Um, so they are actually a financial instrument that the term equity comes from an economist referred to as Oliver. On, Oliver Williamson, who won the Nobel Prize with Eleanor Ostrom in 2010, I think 2010, 2009. Um, 
but he's a transaction cost economist and has a lot of his focus was on um, uh, governance, corporate governance, um, and how you can bring market mechanisms into that. What, so the, the key point here is um, uh, the bonding curve, which is what you've touched on, uh, can be used, you know, people buying into it, investing it, is acting as a market signal, an honest signal for people to um, do things. The prediction markets, for example, in the risk-adjusted bonding curves do the similar sort of thing. You've got skin in the game. But just if you took um, uh, uh, voting, if we just looked at the social choice aspect of things, um, then we can use bonding curves there as well. All right. Um, and there's two uh, principal voting systems that, well, there's actually a few, but um, uh, the, the th three that have actually got a little bit of attention, there's quadratic voting, um, which has been talked about, uh, there's conviction voting and there's commitment voting. Um, so I'll break the things across as uh, quadratic voting is basically um, the idea that um, uh, you, it costs you more and more to buy each vote. Okay, and when I use the word cost here is you can be airdropped, say, a thousand tokens just for the purpose of voting. Okay, um, and then you buy, use those voting credits to buy your votes. And if you have an issue like a proposal and you really, really, really like it, right, um, then I might want to vote 10 times on it. But each time I do, um, the first one's going to cost me one token, the next one's going to cost me two, then that one's going to cost me four, the next one's going to cost me eight, 16. So it's going to get more and more expensive. So uh, we know that if I put um, 10 votes on there, that I actually really like this proposal, so it's worth it. Okay, so that's a, a quadratic curve. Um, there's other uh, voting mechanisms, and this is quite close to how the prediction market stuff works also in the risk of just the bonding curve. Um, so conviction voting basically is uses another curve, does something very similar. Um, but this time you've got to uh, put your, um, you're effectively bonding. It's like delegation, but you're bonding, okay? You're bonding to whatever you want for a period of time. Um, so I might have some ADA and I go in and I lock it into this contract. Um, and uh, that's, uh, the sooner I do that, okay, the more votes I get. Uh, because the longer I hold it in there, um, the more voting power I get. It increases exponentially, right? Um, so that means that shows I've got real conviction. So it's very similar to like investing in a project in a bonding curve very early. Um, but this is for social choice based problems. So I've got this conviction, the longer I keep it in there, um, uh, the more voting power I have. As soon as I take it out, I lose that voting power and I start from the beginning again, okay? Um, so that's called conviction voting. Um, commitment voting takes that and then adds an extra point in it. If your proposal um, actually gets voted, then your tokens are bonded to it for a period of time. So let's say for a month, all right? You're locked away, you can't use them. Even you, if your proposal wins, uh, your tokens that you put into the system are locked away for a month. That's called commitment voting. Um, and that's to get in a, around the situation where people will pump up their votes, powers, or the proposals that they like, and then skive off as soon as it's you know, voted on. All right, so it's a, it's a way of doing this costly signaling. Um, uh, and showing, creating honest signals by, by the actions that you take. And these ideas of quadratic voting, um, commitment voting, and uh, conviction voting are working on the idea of a lost opportunity, or what's referred to as opportunity cost. Because I've bonded my tokens into something, I can't use them for other purposes. Okay, And again, it's a way of creating a strong, honest signal. Okay? Is that... Uh, <laughs> Answer questions there. One of the problems with um, quadratic voting, though, which um, conviction and commitment voting get around, is that quadratic voting, um, uh, because it's so, uh, it, it it doesn't work particularly well in um, the blockchain space at the moment uh, because of Siebel attacks. Okay, it's so cheap to create a wallet. 
I can create thousands of them. And so quadratic voting tends to go towards one take on one vote um, at the moment. So you have to, it will only work with a sort of like one person, one vote. So you need things like um, identity systems that with verified identity uh, for it to actually work. Whereas conviction and commitment voting don't, they work just fine without it. Mm. And uh, there's a whole lot of other uh, voting mechanisms that are out there. There's a lot uh, and different different ways of doing things that have different trade-offs. And also maybe taking sometimes another approach because of voting, okay, is great because it can include the maximum of people into a process. But sometimes it's exactly what you don't want. Yeah. Do I want to include everybody in the decision, which is quite specific and where I know 80 people of the personnel which I included into the voting process have no clue about. So do I really want their vote in this process? Um, so so there's three, really. yeah, well, well, there is, I mean, th there's two ideas that, you know, one of the ideas is saying that, um, uh, let's take Catalyst for example, people should, um, uh, you know, research the project, research the proposal, and then actually uh, vote on, on that research. Um, Otherwise, they shouldn't vote at all, is an argument. But actually, um, voting on expression, I like the title, I think it's called, is just as valid as doing a deep dive research um, in, in many cases, because you're still um, uh, revealing your, you're expressing your feelings, your, your interest in something. Right? Mm -hmm. the, the bigger thing here is that what you touched on was the idea that actually we don't want people to vote. Uh, voting should really be kind of one of the last things we do. Um, it de yeah. de depends in which steps, because when you say, for example, okay, voting, the advantage, it includes the most people as possible into a process. Okay, then what you touch on the point of, for example, in the quadratic, quadratic, uh, quadratic voting system, the problem is with cyber attacks, for example. But when you mm -hmm. say, okay, hey, to have different systems doesn't mean that you have only to choose one. When you speak, for example, also that you want to have experts which are able to vote for stuff they really know about, to say, for example, the very first step for everybody who wants to sign up for voting, you have a commitment voting. So their commitment is to say, okay, I trust this expert, that he makes a good decision. And this expert uses quadratic voting, for example. And this expert is already identified. So when an expert class is using quadratic, quadratic voting, you take off this bad points, the pain points of civil attacks, because you know exactly who those people are. Right. Well, so um, when you have, for example, when you have 200 people using the system, but you have 40,000 wallets, you know that you have a problem. Yeah. And you know exactly who caused the problem, because you just have this 200 people, because they are identified. Um, what you're touching on is, uh, there's a couple of interesting things in there, because um, there is a such uh, delegated voting, and there's also this notion of liquid democracy and liquid voting. Um, so, a delegated uh, thing, for, uh, delegating a vote is a form of liquid democracy. Um, so, I can devote, delegate to someone. Um, you can actually do uh, things whereby um, you can set up mechanisms whereby individuals can position themselves as being, you know, experts, and then people can. Um, delegate their votes to them. Uh, but their reputation status diminishes if they, you know, for example, we'll use Catalyst as an example here. Let's say these experts going out there, going around, they'll do their recommendations and things like that, right? And um, they get re rewarded for all the proposals that they have sort of said, yes, this is a good one. Um, if those proposals actually get voted, they get rewarded for doing that. Um, and through those actions, what you're doing is you're actually building up a reputation signal, right? Um, and so more and more people will delegate to them. If they start to get it wrong, um, then people, you know, their reputation may be discounted. And typically the approach to doing this sort of thing is the, um, it's, you, you want to get towards positive sort of ratings, but if they get it wrong, it, it gets hit hard. Uh, your reputation gets hit really hard. Um, and you can do other sort of designs within that. And the reason for that is that um, you want to basically encourage 
um, people to build up a reputation and then own that reputation. It's so expensive that they don't want to let go of it. So they're going to basically, again, make sure that the decisions and stuff that they do are really, really appropriate, you know, are really good. The um, prediction market stuff inside of the risk adjusted bonding curve has those characteristics. Um, because first of all, it's a form of conviction. There's um, two, um, uh, there's two um, prediction markets. Uh, prediction markets are a form of binary um, option. So uh, one pays out the you know, one side or the other, depending on whether it's successful or not. In the case of the risk adjusted bonding curve, there's two um, markets, one's for success and one's for failure, that pay out on success and or pay out on failure. Um, when you make a bet into that prediction market, you're bonded for the duration, okay? You can't get your project tokens back, right? You can't go and sell them in the uh, AMM that's there, right? You're locked, right, uh, for a period of time until the maturity of that uh, contract is completed and the payout's done. Right, you're, you're bonded in. So if you're going to place a bet on this thing uh, in the prediction market, you'd better be pretty sure that uh, you know what you're talking about because you're you're locked in. So it's creating a really, really strong voting signal. But because of that, right, um, because there's a clear demarcation between success and failure, you can also attach on, well, actually, uh, Felix has been pretty good with his bets on these proposals. And he's always been quite successful. And you build up reputation as a result of that. Right? And so that means other project token holders right, might delegate their tokens to you so that you can place your bets in the prediction market. Because by placing a bet on the prediction market, you're getting a, a, an additional upside when, when the project actually pays out. So it's using this notion of speculation or self-interest and greed to amplify the power of experts, but also create um, a reputation exactly like you were talking about. That's not on the design that's um, going in for this proposal, but that's what I can do with it. No, I'm worried when everyone goes quiet. <laughs> you just, thinking. Just, try, just trying to map all the things together on a, on a logic sense because it, it makes a bunch of sense at least how does it prevent against time travel <laughs> okay there we go <laughs> I, uh, what's I'm, actually, I'm actually asking a genuinely serious I know, question I know, I know it sounds a... ridiculous no. but I just I, we have been here before, and the question we didn't ask last time is how does it prevent against time travel? Well, when you speak about time travel, you have to say already, imagine you travel back in the time, you change anything that says it directly would include already multiversum theory. So your time travel wouldn't, from logic sites, wouldn't be able to have any impact of the reality we are living in right now, because you change already certain atom or anything. So this is happening in another universe. You know, from multiverse theory, because if you would time travel from logic point logic point of view, you destroy the reality. So reality is not able to catch anymore because they can't regenerate a further step which is driven already. So, but I share a sense of being with something else in another time, and that's where my difficulty is. Like a lot of what you talk about is relatively straightforward to feel into and to give you a guidance of like where to direct your bets and i love i love the last piece you shared about betting being able to like if getting good at pre predicting i get, i think was your word yeah yeah it's just where i sit most of the time in life that's it's a fun game but it's it's not difficult my thing is the reason I asked the question is the previous question about how do you protect against malice intent? Because mm. there's people that can do what I do, but not with my intent. Mm. So how do you, and I'll bring it up because the software I play in is Fusion 360 and it's like 3D design stuff, but there's a timeline in it and you can corrupt the timeline by making mistakes and it breaks things. Mm. So if the software can think in that manner, how do you prevent against someone corrupting 
what, yeah, whatever so, we consider a timeline. Yeah, so that's what, um, so I was going to ask you what you meant by time travel, because there is actually a very specific meaning within high frequency trading. It's, we, it's a technique yeah. known as time warping. Um, but, um, uh, yeah. and there's, there's different ways of doing it. But uh, in the case here, what you're referring to is um, uh, it's very close to what's known as uh, minor extractable value, where you're trying to change the order of events um, in terms of what's going on, which happens in a um, Ethereum blockchain space. Um, but here, you, um, it's, I won't say it's not possible. It certainly would be very, very difficult to do to change the order through congestion, which is typically how you do it in high frequency trading. Um, but um, uh, yeah, I'm just trying to think. Um, in at the UTXO layer, you probably wouldn't um, be able to. You've got a very strict order um, in terms of the spending of the UTXOs, so you can't um, change that. The only thing you could do is when two people two uh, transactions are trying to spend the same output. And so you you could possibly play around in that sort of area. Um, I don't know what those attacks look like at the moment. Um, okay. Um, yeah. In terms of uh, malintent, uh, that's strategic actors. That's what we have to design for. That's what the economic modeling is all about. It's not going to be foolproof. There's going to be people that can find uh, oh, no, different ways. The whole damn thing's an experiment. Yeah. The whole thing's an experiment. Mm. I, that was the foundation, right? We agree mm. on that. <laughs> but we can't discover without the experiment, so let's play. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. And people will play. Uh, um, you yeah. expect you should expect that they will, and that they will try and find every flaw that is left in your system. Um, and this is a, a point also, again, for um, formal methods work, formal specification. If you're actually starting to carry quite a lot of value on any of these sort of contracts, whether they're bonkers or DEXs or anything else like that, um, you want to make sure that the likelihood of there being um, a bug or some little way in is minimized as much as possible. Basically a hijack event. Can you have late comers to a party take over what the initial signal was given? Because you talk about using it as a signaling. Yeah. What I um, so, so multiple signaling like alignment. Yeah. Uh, so I would say um, that's always a risk. Uh, and again, I would point to that's kind of the intent of the economic modeling to make sure that you're, you're um, you, when you're using these for sort of signaling purposes that um, it's behaving in the way that you expect it to do. So you know you're you're going to go off and do ra random perturbations of your parameters and run your simulations several thousand times and see if you get any weird behavior. Um, you're going to tweak things around, and that's going to tell you the bounds of what um, your mechanism will operate in in a modeling sense. Um, and then obviously you'll then go and say, right, well let's try and test this out um, in the test net and. Let's do a bit of uh, what might be referred to as chaos engineering, which is what Netflix does. Um, you know, you throw things at it and you try and break the system in your test environment. And then, of course, you'd probably monitor it quite uh, you know, properly in a live environment. So the uh, yummy stuff, for example, the other day, right, um, which uh, was an NFT drop um, that uh, congested the Cardano network. Um, it was... Uh, really well because I was having a little interaction with a uh, economist on Twitter and he was asking about these problems around uh, the different pricing models and uh, uh, dynamic pricing on Cardano and how does it handle congestion and they said well uh, you're basically doing market clearing through um, uh, um, time all right transactions just take longer to confirm uh, but the system will still make progress um, and that's because it's been designed to do that. And that's exactly what happened with the Yummy NFT drop. Everything sort of slowed down, but no transactions were dropped. They eventually all settled. They were cleared through the, the exchange rate, just slowed everyone's uh, um, transaction processing down because there were too many transactions going through in the network. So um, it's just tools. As far as I see it, it's, um, you cannot 
you can't ever stop malintent. Um, there's always going to be just assume that there's there's probably a hole that hasn't been discovered in what you've done. Um, and all you want to do is uh, reduce the probability of those holes being, you know, going from maybe one that's really, really hard to find, um, or sorry, uh, maybe being a, a few, 10, 10 or so, few really easy to find to uh, one that's really hard to find. Uh, and, you know, who knows? Can you can you do something like a reset to previous step state? I don't quite know the word. In uh, like if the you blockchain. find it, yeah, like in your contract that you're talking about, because oh. can you have if if you notice like if you know that this is a possibility and you can't realize every malintent or execution because you just you don't know. So how do you build immunity in the way you could do a reset? So do a reverse transaction. Yeah. Mm, not necessarily reverse, but just go back a step or two. Like how do you like is that mechanism or at least leave it open to be able to add that at a later date? Yeah, you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to go back, but you could definitely reverse, just like you do a double in double entry accounting, you've got a general entry that reverses a transaction. Oh, okay, so just yeah, that so, simple. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Cool. Sort of thing. Um, I might try and wrap this up because I've actually been up <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> Unless you want to carry on. I mean, I can probably do about another 15, 20 minutes or so, but I've been up for about 40 odd hours. <laughs> um, no, there's three, there's three kids that will wake up in six hours. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to wake up in six hours, uh, but we can sort of start to, to wrap. Felix, you look deep in thought. <laughs> Always. <laughs> and just uh, next to the meeting, preparing the last of our IDFS later. Um, I, yeah, I'll, well, unless there's any other sort of questions and stuff, I will probably wrap this up so I can go and crash because I really do need to sleep um, on that area. Um, Some rest. Yeah, yeah. We, we still don't need you for the long run. We can't <laughs> burn you. Not yet. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, hopefully that was worthwhile. And so let's see, we've got, I, I haven't actually been looking at the chat. So, uh, oh, yeah, so can you stage release? Probably rules outcome and promises. Um, I don't know, uh, what do you mean by multiple levels of outcomes and promises? Oh, okay. Um, like if, if you if, deliver 40% yeah. of your, what you promise, yeah. we will pay, like, was, like just stages. Yeah, milestones. There, so there's um, definitely the idea of milestones are in there and there's a definitely the idea cool. of milestone payments that you can do. You can, e there's two ways of doing that. You either engineer that into the actual design of the RBACs themselves. Uh, so they do have stages uh, and that's fine. You, uh, we can do that. Uh, or you use multiple RBACs to represent each stage of the milestone. And so that's where sort of one, one RBAC buys out the other. I like that one better. Yeah, and so you kind of create a, kind, uh, a sort of if then that logic to uh, yeah. stuff, um, and really that, that, that's really interesting because uh, that allows, and that gets closer to the idea of real options uh, analysis with project funding because that means you can adapt. You know, and it's not too similar to dissimilar to what Felix was talking about the DCF and the Mergo and stuff like that. You're setting up these conditional rules for triggering which way you go, or well, at least leave the idea for conditional rules to be adaptable to later. So that you don't like the way you execute the design now leaves that space. Open. Yeah, um, there is. A, I did put in um, some stuff uh, to say that look, we could add in a bidding language into this later on to do literally to do that sort of if then that type of construct. But um, yeah, yeah, something to add, and that can be a really really simple sort of bidding language, not unlike the. Oh, just of... just first, just start mm. simple. Mm. Let's play. And then, yeah, then we have more data. 
That, that's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's cool. Uh, <laughs> who else we got there? Matt's gone. You got a little bit smarter. That's nice. Um, and Peter's gone. Okay, he's gone to practice. Peter's gone to practice his vet. Vietnamese. Right here. They couldn't handle the Robert Dump. <laughs> <laughs> and, and cool to have, to, to have the two O'Briens in the court. <laughs> yeah. how, how does this feel when, when father and son come together in the sessions speaking about weird stuff? <laughs> uh, I'm just I'm just here along for the ride. I'm just listening, trying to learn the language that people speak so that I can also try and adapt that on my own to try and articulate these ideas that we're discussing. Uh, it's the yeah. whole, it's the whole yeah. idea, you know, I think community we, we call more. that old school lurking. <laughs> 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 that was just called lurking where I come from. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right, so, lurking with intent. Sorry. Lurking yeah, with intent. Lurking with intent. <laughs> he's, he's lurking with intent today. That's for, absolutely right. Yeah. Um, what did you want with uh, Felix? What do you want with the, um, my idea fest, my single idea fest? I didn't get people to vote for me, by the way. Ah, I, I, don't, I don't call you Robert or Putin, so. <laughs> <laughs> so because this would make a difference. So we have a check of Brian, the hope, and Robert or Putin, the failed version one. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's all right. I couldn't, I, I actually forgot about it, to be honest. I actually completely forgot about it. Uh, okay. that was about, but it didn't really make much sense. <laughs> so um, I don't know if I, for the Eastern Tunnel, don't know if I made a folder already. Uh, let me do this. I would send you just a link for the folder where you can upload the video. Um, okay. Did you have, have the cut already for the 15 minutes? Yes. Oh? Yeah, yeah. I've already done that. Ah, cool. So when you edit there, I will, then we handle everything over to... Okay. Well, if you send me, uh, if you just send me a uh, link uh, for that, and um, I'll upload it on that, that yes. side of things. So I'll actually stop recording.